and uh, this is this is the, the Repower the Peninsula uh, speaker series where we talk about HEA's uh, renewable goal in January, uh, Homer Electric Association uh, set a goal of being 25% uh, renewable, or I'm sorry, 50% renewable by 2025, um, which, is, uh, which is a fairly ambitious goal. And so we're having the speaker series to talk about uh, all the technologies and uh, practices and methods that could uh, that could achieve that goal. Uh, next slide, please, Satchel. Um, so the specific technology we're talking about now is solar. Uh, and we're going to start by clearing up a misconception. Next slide, please. Uh, the misconception that solar is not really a viable power source in Alaska. Uh, this is a map uh, from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory of uh, uh, solar resources. This is the amount of energy that falls on a square meter of surface in one year in various parts of the U.S. And uh, you can, as you can imagine, if you look uh, up at Washington, um, it, uh, weather is very much a factor. Um, and uh, and even more so in Alaska. So it is it is true that uh, Alaska gets uh, less less energy from the sun than most of the rest of the lower 48. But if you look in the other corner. Uh, there's also Germany, which uh, is one of the world's leaders in solar installation. And uh, 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 recently, they've, they've gotten about 8% uh, of their power uh, from solar energy. And they get uh, roughly comparable um, solar energy exposure as Alaska. So uh, there, there are, of course, of course, a lot of differences between Germany and Alaska, uh, but sunlight is not one of them. So uh, we're going to talk about the, uh, the technology a bit more. Next slide, please, Satchel. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is a concept called the levelized cost of energy, which is uh, sort of the production, the, the, the production cost of a unit of energy uh, over a project's lifetime. So this is uh, every dollar that's spent on a project over its entire life divided by the by how much power it produces over its lifetime. And if you look at this uh, graph, this is from a uh, financial analyst firm called Lazard. Um, the uh, uh, you'll see you'll see that solar has uh, quite a curve over the over the last decade, um, and it's uh, uh, sort of sort of vying vying with wind now for uh, for. Uh, 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 a cheaper cost of power, and uh, so so this this uh, this concept of levelized cost of energy is is, is pretty important for understanding uh, the cost of generation. And one important point, uh, next slide, please, is that uh, uh, the the sticker price for 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 a project is not really uh, reflective of of its cost of energy necessarily. Renewable generation can require more money up front, but uh, give, give cheaper energy for decades. So next slide, please. Um, so you can see uh, the, uh, the adoption of solar in Alaska really kind of reflects this uh, cost decline. Um, around the middle of the last decade, uh, solar started coming online and uh, um, you can see in 2017 that uh, there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of it and and i am i am missing some data there for uh net metering in 2017 so there there is a bit more capacity there than you see on this chart but uh there were really those two uh utility scout projects small ones uh in gba in true uh less less than a megawatt and uh as it as it ramps up next slide please satchel um and uh in uh, 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 20, 2019, uh, there was a project that opened Willow that was uh, uh, 1.2 megawatts, and it was Alaska's largest solar farm at the time. Next slide, please, Satchel. And uh, currently, there are uh, uh, that uh, that was in that was in MEA territory, Madusko Electric Association. And uh, there's another project being considered in the Matsu Valley in Houston that. Uh, is uh, six megawatts, and it would it would be the state's largest if it's uh, um, if it's approved and built. And if uh, there is another project that isn't built, uh, next slide, please, Satchel. Um, there's uh, um, uh, 
proposal that you will be hearing uh, quite a bit more about um, for a 20 megawatt solar farm uh, here on the Kenai Peninsula. And uh, looking at this graph, um, I, I, you might think it looks like uh, the, it's these these two utilities, Manusco Electric Association and Homer Electric Association, who are sort of vying for um, Alaska's largest solar farm. But really, um, uh, neither of these projects are being built by uh, by the utilities. Um, they're being built um, by uh, 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 under a business model called independent power production or IPP, which um, is uh, is where uh, private entrepreneurs uh, put up the capital and uh, 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 build the project and sell the sell the power to the utility, and that's. Uh, uh, about about forty four percent of the generation of the lower forty eight is uh, uh, generated that way, and um, but not much not much on the rail belt. But that's uh, it's starting to change, and it has a lot of potential for bringing renewable energy to the grid uh, pretty fast. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, we're going to talk uh, talk with Jen Miller. Uh, who uh, is the CEO and co-founder of uh, Renewable IPP, um, the company that's behind, uh, I believe, I believe all three of those solar projects that I that I mentioned there, um, and uh, we're going to talk specifically about the um, a project, the the Kenai Pencil project, the twenty megawatt project. Um, so, uh, can we stop sharing the slides? All right. Uh, hello, Jen. Hey, Ben. Yeah, great introduction, uh, an overview of the solar industry, especially in Alaska. Yeah, just kind of neat to see it told through a timeline. That's exciting. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's sort of exciting to to see it in, in real life. So, um, so you're uh, you're a co-founder of, of Renewable IPP, um, and uh, what's uh, what's 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 the the story of the company? How did how and uh, I guess I guess why did did you and your co-founders uh, start this? Yes, yeah, so it's kind of interesting. So it's myself and uh, three business partners uh, co-founded Renewable IPP back in 2017, and um, that year, uh, my partner Chris and our other business partner Sam, we were all. Chris was actually kind of watching the solar panel supply and solar panel prices coming down just rapidly. And he thought, man, we looked at this 10 years ago about putting solar in our house, but let's let's see if the economics work now because we're both, um, yeah, we're all kind of like, I don't know, financial independence nerds as well. <laughs> and so we like to run economics on things. And um, anyways, looked at the economics of putting it on our house and said, gosh, this looks good. And so we did our own, talked to Sam about it as well. And um, both of us put solar on our houses uh, that summer, 2017, and saw it work out. And we thought, gosh, you know, this is such a cool technology and really, you know, both of us or all the partners are really passionate about, you know, one, deploying renewable energy in Alaska, but then also, you know, we have the second highest uh, electricity cost in the nation. And so we said, gosh, this, this could, you know, one, deliver renewable energy, but then two, deliver it to help suppress electricity prices for Alaskans. And uh, we looked at different business models and we were really, uh, hone in quickly on wanting to do utility scale solar just because it's so much easier to do one really big project well than to try and manage like a hundred small projects. And so we thus, yeah, then we said, well, how, you know, how hard could it be? Well, let's just build one big system. And, um, and actually there was a project before the 1.2 megawatt project in Willow, we did a pilot project the summer before. So we started in 2017 and 2018, we did a 140 kilowatt pilot project. And we uh, procured land for that. Um, at that size, we didn't need a special agreement with the utility, so that part was easy. And then um, we financed and built the project with our own hands, uh, which was awful, <laughs> but we did it. And, um, and then that kind of proved the utility scale model before um, deciding to take off the bigger, or take on the 1.2 megawatt size project. And so, yeah, so that's the story of how we got started. And um, yeah, we're just really passionate. You know, right now we're focused on the rail belt just because we want to reduce as much carbon as possible and have um, the biggest impact as we can. So yeah, it's been an exciting ride. <laughs> and I, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, uh, all of the co-founders were, were working in the oil industry at the time as, as engineers. Um, how, did, how did that experience prepare you for uh, this company? Do you think that's, that's sort of widely applicable um, 
uh, a, a, a career course that uh, that's that's going to be available to to a lot of Alaskans that transition. Yeah, honestly, I think it's great um, technical training for how to, um, you know, in the oil and gas industry, you're always looking at, um, you know, one of our, uh, Chris Colbert, he's a super savvy on the subsurface side. So you're looking at all this uncertainty and you're trying to make these complex decisions. And it's like, well, how do you boil it down and have the confidence to say, yeah, like we're most likely going to be successful if we make this decision. And so he has a ton of um, uncertainty analysis background. Sam and myself, uh, we're on the project management side. And so it's like, okay, we get that we have a goal, we wanna do something, but how do you get from A to B or maybe A to B to C to D to E to F <laughs> um, and manage all the stakeholders and do it um, under budget and on schedule. And so that project management experience and managing technical projects, especially knowing you know, what are the requirements to do this well and to have a quality build and kind of what are all the gotchas that you know, can bite you on the cost or quality side and knowing how to look out for those. Um, it, it applies to any technology. Um, but one thing I would put a plug in for, you know, what's awesome about Alaska is we have a ton of really well-trained um, oil and gas professionals. And I think they would segue to this industry very well I think they would find it very gratifying because oil and gas projects are super frustrating. The, the reservoir is always different. The design's always different. So there's never good cost bench, benchmarks. And it's also, you're dealing with a highly hazardous substance. And so there's a lot of risk that you're taking on um, and they know how to manage that risk well. Um, but anyway, solar is just such a simple technology. Like once you know how to build one row, you know how to build all of them. You know what the cost is. There, there isn't the hazard there. Um, anyway, so I just think, yeah, the, the engineering and project management and finance backgrounds transfer super well to the renewable energy industry. So uh, let's talk let's talk specifically now about the Camp Peninsula project. Um, so, uh, so, so, you're, so you're doing this as an independent power producer. That means you'll be you'll be selling selling electricity to HEA. Um, why, why are you confident that it can uh, suppress or reduce uh, energy prices for HEA? Yeah, so one thing that's been, yeah, it's been interesting learning about the utility world and how Alaska co-op utilities work. Um, but roughly for Homer Electric, um, about two thirds of, their, of the electricity cost to members is actually like a fixed cost that we really can't affect at all. And so that's, you know, debt from previous infrastructure projects, overhead, other things like that. But a third of the electricity cost is attributed to fuel to create generation for, um, for electricity. And so uh, I believe it's 86% of Homer Electric's energy is generated using natural gas. And so natural gas prices from the Crick Inlet since the 1990s have been escalating at 5% a year. And uh, when we look at our energy contracts, you know, we're looking, we're requesting like 25 year contracts so that we can amortize the capital costs over a long period of time, just like you want to do with your house. And um, anyways, to get long-term contracts like that, the regulatory commission needs to see that a really low escalator on the, on the contract. And so it's usually less than 2%. And so if you're looking at natural gas prices escalating at 5%, our contracts will escalate less than 2%. And then that's how we help suppress energy prices. So it's, it's really just reducing that generation cost. And uh, well, I guess I guess on that note, uh, what what are the operating costs of a, of a solar farm? We saw we saw on that graph of uh, levelized cost of energy that the the sticker price isn't really all that goes into it. Uh, once once the farm is built, uh, what does it what does it cost to operate? Yeah, so the operating costs, um, just to describe what they are, the biggest one is um, is snow clearing, and so we do we manually clear and hire. Um, we actually pay pretty well to go do snow clearing in the winter time to keep our panels producing year round. Um, and there's also vegetation management to make sure that you know weeds and stuff are under control in the summer. Um, and then the other significant operating expenses are things like insurance, like property insurance, or <laughs> asset, and um, and then also um, and property taxes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well. Um. How does, how does variability uh, come into this? Um, we know there's there's the seasonal variability of, of sunlight here and uh, um, also also the short-term variability of, of, of clouds. Um, so so how, 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 how does your project deal with that and how does that affect uh, the arrangement you're seeking with HEA? 
Yeah, so yeah, definitely, you know, we have um, models that predict, you know, hourly forecasts basically based on historical um, uh, weather and sun data. And um, that information, we work with the utility to analyze it. And really what they're looking for is, you know, like how quickly, like if a cloud comes over, how fast does your production drop off? And what is that, what are the effects on the grid? Because, you know, ultimately, you know, HEA is accountable for, for providing the amount needed and for doing that reliably. And they're the ones that get all the phone calls from customers <laughs> instead of us. And so um, anyway, so what we end up doing is we'll be deploying the new battery energy storage system, the Tesla battery that um, HEA installed and using that to, it's, it's called regulate the intermittent energy. And so then that smooths out those drop-off curves so that doesn't destabilize the grid. Um, but that how it affects our agreement with HEA is that basically there's a price for that, right? And so because we're not providing what's called firm power, that's 100% predictable, um, then we pay what's called a regulation fee to smooth out our intermittency, basically. And so, um, and we do that because 100% as an independent power producer, um, none of our project or system costs can be passed on to the members whatsoever. And so we have to cover 100% of what's called the integration cost or that regulation fee and the cost to interconnect the project to the grid and any grid upgrades that are required to do that. And so anyway, so there's just an additional charge that goes on our, that we pay um, to cover that regulation fee. Um, and then that's actually one of the reasons we're asking for property tax relief is our previous projects, the Houston and Willow ones, they're small enough that their intermittency really isn't felt within the grid. Um, but now that we're getting into such large scale projects, we're starting to see the need for that regulation charge. And so because we have to pay that extra fee, then we're looking for some relief in other areas of our operating expenses. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, on the on the subject of the of the of the property tax exemption that you're seeking, um, uh, you, you you've kind of you kind of outlined some of the reasons already. Um, are there are there others? And then uh, is the project feasible without that exemption? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, the main reason is to help cover that integration regulation charge. Um, and just to give folks a feel for the scale. So yeah, because the um, solar assets, they're just like a large infrastructure project. And so you, know, you think about, and usually like when it comes to infrastructure, governments build a lot of that, like whether it's roads or co-op utilities building generation facilities. Um, and so they're all nonprofits that are not subject to um, the property taxes. But in our case, it's kind of a unique model where we are able to try and figure out a way for the economics to work that they can be privately funded. Um, but these property taxes, because it's such a large capital asset, we're talking about like a $30 million project, um, that the property tax, when you take the straight mill rate, that eats up about 10% um, of 10 to 15% of our revenue. So it's like a 10 to 15% tax on the business, um, which is much higher than a traditional, like say a restaurant or other, other types of businesses. Um, and so it's just overly burdensome on the project and really hurts the economics. Um, so that's, yeah, that's why we're asking for, for some relief. Um, and, you know, and I've done, you know, <laughs> we love Excel and uh, uncertainty analysis. And so we've, We've run the numbers a lot of different ways because we don't quite know what that regulation fee will be from the utility because they're still doing analysis on their end, which is great. Um, but yeah, you know, with the property, without the property tax exemption, the project has say a 20% chance of success that all the financial parameters come together. Um, but with the property tax exemption, it's more like an 80% chance of success. And so that's, yeah, that's kind of, I said, okay, well, yeah, then we definitely need it. <laughs> Um, if you do, what's, uh, what's the timeline for the project? Uh, say, say you, you get an exemption sometime in the first half of 2022. Um, when, when could you come online? Yeah, right now our draft schedules, we'd be targeting to, uh, start construction in 2023 and finish in 2024. Um, and so yeah, roughly project development on solar projects takes anywhere from two to three years. Um, because we do a lot of detailed studies to look at, you know, that those integration um, calculations and also looking at interconnecting our system to the grid. And anyway, so yeah, there's a lot of studies and then also just bringing the financial partners together and um, having the contract reviewed by the regulatory commission. So 
yeah, a lot of fun steps. <laughs> well, zooming out from the Kenai Peninsula project uh, a bit, um, speaking about IPPs generally, um, uh, do you think do you think we'll we'll start to see more of them in Alaska? And uh, what are some of the drivers of that? And what are the obstacles? Yeah, I mean, I think right now is an interesting time, and we're at a tipping point, and could kind of go one way or another. Um, you know, wind and solar prices have really come down to where they are competitive and can, can be pursued here in Alaska. Um, and so I think, you know, ho hopefully soon our, um, our contract for the Houston project will get filed with the regulatory commission. And if that's successful and going through and that project, you know, goes into construction, then I think it really says, hey, you know, the projects like these you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, there, there's been some IPP projects that have been proposed in the past and have resulted in kind of long, um, I guess, public argument <laughs> periods um, that we've seen and then it leaves kind of a bad taste in people's mouth or maybe IPPs look at it and say, oh, like, is there really an appetite there or is this a workable system? Um, but we've had our Willow project contract go through and that went through very smoothly, got approved in 45 days. Um, my hope is that something similar happens for Houston. And then I think people will start to look and say, okay, great. Like, hey, the prices are there. Um, there's interest uh, within the state to have more IPPs and they see projects being successful, then I think it could really take off. All right. Well, um, we'll open up now to the audience questions. So if uh, anyone on the call has, uh, has questions, you can put them in the chat or just uh, since there are that many of us, just just say them. Well, um, if not, uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Jen, and we'll. Uh, um, you can. Uh, I know you. I know you have. Uh, you have. You have other commitments this evening, so you can run if you'd like, or stay on the line, and we might have some questions later. But. Okay. Uh, um, in the meantime, if, if, if there are no questions, uh, we also have uh, uh, Hig with us, um, who is a member of the Kenai Peninsula Resilience and Security Commission. Uh, they're, they're an advisory commission to the borough about uh, um, energy and uh, general resilience issues. Um, and they, uh, they recommended a tax exemption um, to the borough that uh, hopefully will be coming up sometime soon. And so Hig, Hig's going to talk a bit about why, uh, why they made that recommendation. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep this very brief, um, but, uh, and, and I'll also speak very much from, uh, you know, in general, I, I might be speaking as myself, but in this case, I'll do my very best to speak within the, uh, within the confines of the memo that we passed as uh, this whole commission. So that, Resilience and Security Commission is a fairly new uh, body that is um, part of the Kenai Peninsula Borough and our, um, we're an advisory commission so our role is in part to um, provide um, advice to the assembly about, about steps they could take and this idea of uh, property tax exemption that might apply to a project like one Jen was just discussing um, uh, came up. And we we spoke uh, extensively with Jen about what what uh, they were thinking, and and then went and tried to understand what this issue was uh, more broadly. And um, the main thing we focused on there is this idea of IPPs. And and you've already heard heard some good background on this, but the the basic concept within the context of HEA is that HEA is a um, uh, is a cooperative, so it's actually run by you know the by the ratepayers, um, and so it's a nonprofit corporation, um, and uh, um, and then an IPP potentially could work with HEA and sell that electricity sell electricity to HEA. And in some ways, this is a really attractive option because it it creates the possibility for this public private partnership where. A private company like Renewable IPP can come in and they can do their own sourcing of, um, of capital to build a project. Um, and because of the constraints that are on a public utility like HEA um, through the regulatory commission, um, the ratepayers are, are quite well protected from any sort of sort of price gouging behavior or whatever you might you might worry about there. Um, and so if we were thinking, for instance, about solar development, 
there are sort of two rate routes and ideally they're both both worth considering. One is that the utility would go and develop a solar uh, installation themselves and, and use that uh, to produce electricity. The ratepayers would directly pay for that, um, but then they would get the benefits of that, of that uh, electricity. And the other is that there'd be a private company like Renewable IP, IPP that would come in. And, um, and the differences between these are pretty subtle, uh, uh, but I think really important. I think that like there are sometimes it can work really well if you have this completely transparent public process by which a, a utility might, you know, HEA might uh, develop solar, but that's sort of the innovation and the access to investment capital and such that come with the private sector can be really awesome too. So we'd like to see both of these models out there working for us. Um, and the property tax itself becomes this weird uh, asymmetry here. Um, the, the utility does not pay property taxes for anything that they do, but uh, a, at least where things are right now, a private company would. And um, so that was the basic core of our, of our argument that, uh, that actually would make sense for uh, the borough to actually institute a, um, a property, property tax exemption for all IPP. So this wouldn't be um, exclusively solar. It wouldn't even be exclusively renewables as we, as, as we framed it. Um, although renewables are probably probably primarily what we're talking about here. And I guess the last thing I'll just mention from from our analysis and says from what we did there is that we did look at, you know, what, you know, our IPP is a thing. <laughs> they absolutely are, except not in Alaska. I mean, you know, Jen, there are a few other people. There's this really cool uh, uh, hydro project that went in uh, on, on MEA uh, fairly recently that was an IPP project. There are a few little things, but it's a tiny part of our electricity in Alaska, whereas nationwide, it's very big and getting bigger very fast because this model is actually proving very effective, especially for bringing renewables online. Um, uh, if you look at future, future projects, uh, um, the the uh, renewable energy is dramatically <laughs> dominated by IPP development. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, it seems like a very valuable model. And, and my hope is that the borough might, might pursue this, this, uh, this property tax exemption and that, that, would, uh, that would help make it a part of our, our lives here. All right, well, thank you, Hig. And, uh... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll also have, have uh, some questions and answers uh, with you uh, later on. Um, but uh, can, we, uh, uh, can, we, can we share the slides again, Satch? We'll go back to slide six. Yes, slide six. So aside aside from these uh, these big planned projects um, that are the sort of hatched ones, uh, you'll notice that uh, most of the most of the solar capacity on the rail belt grid it, uh, hasn't really been built by utilities either. It's a uh, rooftop solar that uh, is coming through through net metering, um, which is a uh, a program that you'll uh, uh, you'll hear some more about uh, very soon. Um, uh, we have um, uh, Mark Holler with us, um, who is um, the uh, uh, the owner of, of Midnight Sun Solar, a local local solar installer, um, and he uh, he and uh, the other people in his business have have put up most of this uh, 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 rooftop solar that you can see here on the in the yellow and orange blocks. So uh, uh, we can. Uh, we, uh, we can put away the slides now, and uh, we'll uh, uh, have 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 Mark talk a bit about uh, rooftop solar, um, what what role it plays in a decarbonized grid, and uh, what are uh, some of the things happening in his industry. So, uh, good to have you, Mark. Thanks for the intro, Ben um, and Jen and Hig. Um, thanks for the input. I'm always really excited to see all this stuff. Uh, that renewable IPP is putting up. You guys are making some really awesome strides. And so it's awesome to see that someone's able to um, <clears throat> to get it to economically work and have a project um, be successful. So we're, we're really excited down here on the peninsula to see your guys' developments towards working towards your farm. And, um, you know, you brought up a really interesting point earlier about some of the dynamics with the utility and those 
those ramp ups and those ramp downs and kind of doing a formalized study for that. And I think once that information emerges, um, it's going to be really cool to see how how it can be dynamically integrated into the into the grid um, and exactly how that plays out for, you know, of course, our really unique energy and production landscape that we have up here in Alaska. Um, you know, and it's definitely a, a very unique um, environment for multiple aspects. Um, and that's, you know, those are some pretty broad concepts. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here today to just talk a little bit more about some of the home net metering um, that uh, we have access to and that's available um, to us here on the Kenai Peninsula and as well as across the rail belt. So I'm gonna spool up a, a little, a few slides um, and if everyone can, is everyone got a good view on the screen there? We're good, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm Mark, um, I'm recently just as early as this year, the beginning of the year became a resident of the Kenai Peninsula um, and I um, operate uh, Midnight Sun Solar. We're a, we're a home um, solar installer. We also do uh, quite a bit in um, off-grid type solar as well, um, but really been enjoying um, being down here on the peninsula and trying to do what we can to advocate for the industry. Um, I recently um, was brought onto the Resiliency and Security Advisory Commission, so I work alongside um, Hig there to um, do what we can to help advise the borough of um, some of these emerging technologies and, and help them do research that they might not necessarily have time to do and um, talk to other professionals and, and um, see different ways that we can increase the resiliency here on the peninsula. So really um, happy for those opportunities and <clears throat> to be able to um, see some deployment um, um, on the Kenai. Uh, let's see here. So um, just so everyone just has a real basic understanding and most everyone does what we're talking about when we say a home solar system. Um, we're essentially talking about a, a relatively small um, array, something that's usually to the tune of, of six to maybe 10 or so kilowatts where um, folks can uh, produce energy and um, help offset their <clears throat> utility billing through the net metering program. Um, and so these are these are just some of the components uh, used to to tie into the utility, and you can kind of see there in the bottom right. Um, there's some labeling requirements and some um, disconnects that your utility requires, but kind of beyond that, it's a system that's made to tie into the existing home electrical system. Um, and so we've we've seen the technology progress uh, to a point um, now where it's it's generally pretty easily uh, deployed and the, the technologies are um, accepted by the utility, the equipment um, can meet the, the standards that the utility has for, for the, um, the power and making sure that it's, that it's going to um, interact properly. Um, and, and the energy just at the, at the end of the line from the home over to the utility company is gonna be the meter kind of keeping track of all the different um, energy that flows in and energy that flows out. And um, that, that meter there is the, is the mechanism for the, the, the physical accounting for the kilowatt hours that get exchanged between um, the utility and the, and the user at the home. Um, and this is just a real basic um, line diagram of kind of the, the general tie-in. Um, and so it's, it's nothing, um, too terribly wild outside of um, other really similar type things you're gonna have in your home as far as the way that it gets wired and the way that it integrates in. Um, and that's a result of a lot of development of the technology over the years and, and seeing a lot more adoption. Um, and so um, Ben had a couple of questions that he asked um, and I'm, I wanted to answer kind of during this presentation is, um, you know, does Alaska and Homer Electric uh, specific down to the peninsula have good net, good net metering po policies and how could they be better? Um, so um, they do have good net metering policies uh, as of 2010 is when um, the net metering policies were adopted um, through the regulatory commission. Um, and so that program currently exists across all the, the rail belt utilities and folks have access to be able to, to net meter their power. And I have a, a 
slide further down that kind of shows an example of, of a bill from the from the net metering program. Um, as with any of the programs, you know, there are some specific caps um, to them. And um, Homer Electric has actually recently, um, over the last couple of years, ran into their, their upper limit for their cap. And um, they have continued to allow folks to be able to, to net meter. Um, and it, and that's, that's something that they were no longer obligated to have to do. So um, the door is still open for folks to have a home solar system and to also be able to um, net meter their energy, um, which is great. It, it's a really um, easy, simple program um, to, to allow homeowners access to solar. Um, and so um, it's relatively small scale, you know, um, just a really small drop in the bucket compared to some of these larger utility endeavors um, that renewable IPP and some of those other power producers are going after. Um, it's just a much more localized thing that folks can do kind of in their own home. <clears throat> and it's wonderful that that program's available. And what makes it so simple is it's kind of virtual in a sense of how you store your energy, where you can produce energy during the day from your solar system and your meter counts those kilowatt hours. And then you can use that energy during the night from the utility and you get to basically in a monthly time frame, um, put in and take out of that pool of kilowatt hours. So um, that increases its simplicity because it reduces really the need for a battery to be able to use some energy that you produce during the day in the nighttime. Um, which is going to keep the costs for a system like that much lower um, and more folks are, are going to uh, be able to achieve that. Um, and so what we've seen is, is a pretty widespread adoption from um, all the way from the early adopters to, you know, a lot of average consumers are, are actively looking at um, installing solar on their home. Um, and uh, we've also seen acceptance on the utility side of uh, being comfortable with the equipment and the policies that the, that go into the system to install them, um, making the process relatively easy. Um, so that um, al you know allows the door to be open for some more deployment. Um, you know, to answer the question, how could some of the net metering policies be a little bit better, um, or just kind of the, the solar policy in general, not necessarily net metering, but um, in, under the net metering umbrella. Um, if Alaska was able to entertain possibly being able to reconcile those kilowatt hours on an annual basis versus a monthly basis um, can increase some of the economics of the solar system. Um, you know, as far as if, how big of an ask that is or not, um, you know, I, we would really want to see how that's going to impact the utilities. And, you know, I think largely it would be something that would go to the regulatory commission to, to get a, a level of change. Um, but it could potentially open the door for folks to have a 100% kilowatt hour offset um, and make um, large amounts of energy in the summertime um, that they could virtually store and potentially use in the wintertime. Um, some other states um, do have annual net metering. However, Alaska's net metering program is monthly. Um, so that's a way that it could potentially improve or open the door for folks um, later. Um, and then there, there are a few caps. One we talked about earlier was just a system-wide capacity cap where there's a certain percentage of, of renewable that could be net metered through the, through the utility. Um, <clears throat> that's the cap that Homer Electric had hit and, um, and had increased. And then um, and, and it's still open for folks to be able to, to net meter their power. Uh, but there's also a cap on a system size, which is about 25 kilowatts, which it covers most um, um, homeowner size systems, so home solar is generally much smaller than a 25 kilowatt size system. And so it's not much of an issue on the home front. However, um, in some of the commercial spaces, the 25 kilowatt system cap size um, can sometimes be a little bit limiting towards some of the consumption that the, the larger commercial folks might have. Um, and then, you know, this is outside of the net metering umbrella, but something maybe policy wise, is that could um, make things a little bit better is if, you know, we could start integrating some financing mechanisms um, into um, potentially some of the HEA billing or um, loan programs that they have available to them um, or some of the kind of green banking programs. I know that, that there's been talks of and that could potentially be coming online soon here. Um, but 
if we're able to make sol solar a little bit more affordable for folks, um, then you know we could potentially see some some future growth in that that net metering program as well. Um, and just kind of here at the bottom, as per a report from uh, from Alaska Center Center of Energy and Power a gentleman over there named Chris Pike. Uh, put together a really nice report, um, and there was a 52% increase in the net metering program in the, the year of 2020. Um, and I've yet to uh, look at some data from from 2021, but there's quite a few solar installs that got deployed. So it was just seen a tremendous amount of success in the program, um, and a lot of folks doing solar in the home. Um, so you know we've really seen um, some, some success in that front. So this is just kind of a, a brief uh, overview of, of really how the, the nuts and bolts of net metering and how it works. So um, it's on a 30 day billing cycle. Um, for instance, if you produce 10 kilowatt hours and um, you consume five kilowatt hours, you'd get billed for that net difference. Um, the bills reconcile monthly versus annually, kind of talked about a little bit earlier. And then if, if you happen to go into an overproduction scenario and, and you, you have a say for instance, negative credit, um, they would just kind of roll some of your credits forward. Um, and then each utility kind of has some interesting um, sub dynamics of their, their net metering programs and also some uh, minimum charges that are on the billing. And um, you folks will still have a customer charge that's on their bill and, and will, they'll be displayed on a uh, example bill here in a second. Um, but the, they'll also have a minimum kilowatt hour charge on Homer Electric which is 150 kilowatt hours. So they're still gonna get um, billed for those kilowatt hours, but they can actually, if they go into overproduction, can still contribute towards those minimums um, with uh, some potential overproduction. And I'll show a little graph too of production versus kind of what the billing metrics look like. Um, we talked about some of the caps just a minute ago of that um, the site location, 25 kilowatts. That's kind of just for a, firepower of a solar system at a single location. And then the one and a half percent of the previous year's average demand kind of establishes a system-wide cap for the whole um, HEA grid. And that one and a half percent um, got passed long ago. Um, and I don't know exactly where they're at. Maybe someone from HEA might be able to chime in and say exactly where that number is, but. Um, I, I, I could chime in right now. So we took the one and a half percent that the RCA mandated and when, as we were approaching that, HA went to 3%. And as we were set to blow through that, um, we asked for as, thought, as much as we thought we could get. And we asked for 10% and the RCA said no. And so our current limit is 7% of our previ previous year average demand, which is the highest on the rail belt, which the good bit is it makes it easier for every other utility on the rail belt to go up to where we are, <laughs> but, we're on the leading edge and um, HEA was willing to allow more net metering than the RCA was. Thanks for that explanation. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens when 7% gets closer. And I, um, it, sorry if I asked and you have to repeat yourself, but where's HEA at close to that 7%? Currently, yeah, uh, from five from memory, we're at the five point eight percent. I could jump on my phone and check the there's a monthly email, but yeah, I think we're at five point eight percent now. No worries, awesome. That fills up so fast, amazing. <clears throat> it, it is a exponential function, <laughs> and uh, every year install capacity is more than any previous year. Cool. Um, so, you know, leading into this, this is a, this is a bill that um, Tyler Cheatwood actually um, mocked up for me from uh, Homer Electric. And so the bottom line, the total due number is a little skewed. We don't really, uh, if you had a negative $220 electric bill, you would probably have some real honking uh, unaffordable solar system. Um, but it kind of expresses some of the dynamics um, where it just kind of shows on the bill um, with what the net meter that's physically installed at your at your location is able to do is it it's able to um, read the power flowing in both directions. So HEA can now have a bird's eye view on the kilowatt hours that transfer from that meter over to the utility. 
and then vice versa, the kilowatt hours that transfer from the utility back over to the customer. Um, you know, this this bill could be updated because it, it doesn't actually have some of the the um, uh, kilowatt the minimum kilowatt hour charges displayed on it, um, which affects a portion of this bill. But the the next slide I have will kind of give you give a more of a uh, look from an annual and monthly perspective of what that looks like. Um, but this is just to say that really there's not a whole heck of a lot that changes between the customer and the utility, except for once the net meter is installed, the mechanism for the bill to properly be um, quantified exists physically. And that's kind of where that net meter program gets its name because that, that net meters at the home there and it's, it's counting all the kilowatt hours flowing in both directions. Um, and so this is a, this is a, uh, performance projection that we put together uh, recently from a system. Um, so it's got some updated um, information. And um, this is, you know, the production of a, a roughly three and a half kilowatt size solar array. So, you know, about 12 solar panels is a, is a pretty average size solar system for a home. Um, and this is for folks that are using approximately 650 kilowatt hours in the um, in the winter uh, months and then um, you know by virtue typically less in the summer and so you can see the top graph there is just a, a solar array production graph overlaid with a, uh, a home electric consumption um, and usually you know our target is we like to we like to get folks to a 50 percent offset in terms of kilowatt hours annually um, is what we shoot for and usually <coughs> excuse me that gets them um, to some pretty even production in the um, summer months compared to what they're using. Um, and so, you know, we generally don't wanna oversize systems too much because um, there's, a, there's a point at which some of the economics um, increase, the, increase the payback time or the return on investment time. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so if we offset about 50% of the kilowatt hours annually, um, that gets to a nice, pretty even offset in the summer. And then a lot of times what, what, what we're seeing from um, customers is that they generally have some future electric consumption that is going to be part of their, their future growth, whether that's in the form of an electric vehicle or, or possibly a heat pump. And so if they're uh, installing panels, say for instance, on their roof, sometimes they'll um, go for, they'll opt for a slightly larger array knowing that maybe in the future they might have some um, increased consumption that they're trying to cover. <coughs> me. Um, and then, so the bottom graph is a overlay of uh, solar billing and um, billing from the utility uh, without solar panels. And so, um, you know, we can offset that utility cost by roughly uh, about 50% per year. Um, and, you know, you can see we can't really shrink those blue bars um, down to absolute zero in the summer months because um, it's accounting for some of those um, minimums on the bill uh, that we talked about earlier in the form of a customer charge <clears throat> and a minimum kilowatt hour charge. Um, but all that being said, um, the, si the systems usually have a really great um, economic uh, cumulative cash flow where they're often paying for themselves between year 10 and year 12, kind of depending on um, exactly how it's deployed and some of the site specifics. So um, because of that, you know, we're seeing a, a huge rise in popularity and, and folks are <clears throat> folks are adopting at the home level and, um, you know, trying to um, let, smooth out some of their energy costs over time. Um, <clears throat> so one of the questions uh, Bennett asked is, are there any emerging emerging technologies, practices, policies that could change home solar home solar in the next several years? Um, and we're we're seeing a lot of innovations right now as um, in batteries. You know, we see the battery technology getting um, better and, and more affordable. Um, not quite as steep as the curve um, as for solar panels themselves, but um, you know, we've seen a lot more battery deployment um, this year as well as, I mean, gosh, even at the utility level, um, HEA brought on their battery pack online, which is um, just a massive, um, awesome battery pack. Um, and so we're seeing that technology um, get much better. And like Jen has said earlier, it really helps um, give, so it makes solar and renewables more attractive because it can 
increase the resiliency of that technology and, and increase some of the predictability of being able to smooth out the peaks and the valleys of um, production, uh, which, you know, um, solar and, and other renewables being more variable. Um, so batteries are, are really contributing towards that. And I, I feel like we're going to see some great developments on that front. Um, electric vehicles, I mean, I'm sure everyone's been um, seen um, in the news and just locally the adoption of electric vehicles, you know, at Whistle here, um, here in Whistle Hill here in Soldatna that recently um, installed the level three Tesla charger, uh, which is the first one in the state. And so we're, we're starting to see all this electric vehicle infrastructure come online. And that is giving consumers more confidence in the electric vehicle technology and more confidence in um, adopting that technology and being able to um, you know, offset that carbon metric in their life as well. Um, so that front has really been um, increasing and I think it's gonna provide a ton of opportunity um, here in the upcoming years. And um, it does also give folks another um, avenue to uh, potentially store kilowatt hours um, that a solar array might produce and um, use that in their car. Um, and then we're, you know, we're seeing heat pumps being um, brought online more often now, um, being retrofitted into existing heating systems, as well as, um, you know, new construction type homes, um, implementing that technology as well. Um, so that's something that's going to um, increase demand on the grid, which would be, which would be wonderful. And um, therefore, having more renewable energy sources to um, have uh, as production on the grid, kind of those, those two things would kind of go hand in hand. Um, you know, on the policy level, uh, just in Alaska, I know that there's a lot of working groups that are really working towards, you know, green banks or financing mechanisms to get more of this type of technology into the average consumer's home um, for um, a more affordable price or something that can be paid for over time. Um, and I think that's going to really um, give a different demographic access to the technology. Um, and so we've seen a lot of development there. And I know that um, from the administrative level, you know, in terms of government, we, we were lucky where we've gotten tax credits extended um, at 26% for um, solar for the investment tax credit um, for this year and for next year. Um, and that got extended um, in the COVID bill. Um, so that was recent. And I know that the current administration has some re renewable goals and that there's some um, things that are happening on that front. You know, there's nothing um, that's been proposed or set in stone at this point that I've seen that um, is something concrete down on paper, but, um, you know, I, I feel like there could potentially be some more incentives coming come in that way. So that will always be really helpful for this type of deployment of this technology. Uh, our hope is that costs will continue to decrease over the years and um, renewables will just be a, a very um, comparable economic player with some of our conventional means of generation. Um, so um, one, of the, one of the last questions um, Ben had was, or actually I think there's one more after, but what place does home solar have in the zero carbon um, energy system? And I think the big important thing and um, kind of uh, what Jen said earlier about staying on the rail belt grid is um, if you can collect the, the energy and use it locally, then you're just reducing all those carbon footprints. You don't have to transport this energy. You don't have to use fossil fuel to create it. Um, and so that um, is, you know, largely reducing the that carbon footprint of that home. You know, taking that home closer to net zero. But you know, like I kind of discussed a little bit earlier, solar is just one type of technology to implement. You know, there's a whole suite of different things folks can do at their home to continue to contribute towards a zero carbon home. You know, solar isn't the answer alone. You know, things are important like building envelopes and, um, you know, what you're, what you're doing with your power when you are making it and making homes efficient um, is, is a big focus too. And so, you know, all these technologies go hand in hand. So we're just one, one piece of the puzzle um, of an overall, an overall larger vision of just trying to um, reduce carbon. Um, and, you know, um, one question specific to this year is, you know, how, how did we get affected by some supply and chain issues and, and how are we responding as installers or small business owners? Um, so, you know, we saw price of in, price increases in a lot of our materials this year for like steel and copper and, um, and fuel, uh, fuel was a big one. Um, so that's kind of um, some of the supply chain has, has increased some lead times for our materials. They've been a little bit, lot, takes a little bit longer to get them. 
Um, and the availability of, of certain things has kind of um, waxed and waned throughout the year. Um, so the, those are things that we all kind of had to deal, deal with this year. Um, some of it we kind of slightly anticipated, some of it, um, some of it was a little bit surprising. Um, you know, that translates to some increased operating overhead for the, for the installers. Um, you know, things that we can do to combat that or how we're responding is, we're, you know, we're trying to get good at forecasting and, and seeing what these markets potentially could do and trying to um, see what we can do in the way of either um, acquiring materials in bulk or um, having different strategies for the products that we use or the types of products that we use. I know one thing for us this year, big time, is we've, we've switched over to a lot of more domestic manufacturers for a lot of our, our major materials. And um, that, that helped with um, some of the supply chain issues that we're, we're dealing with. And then, you know, any good practice supply chain issues or not, just trying to increase our operational efficiency. Of course, the Kenai Peninsula being a big bit of ground to cover. Um, so, you know, being efficient when we are in different areas, um, you know, across the Kenai is, is helping to keep those costs down. You know, in a nutshell, I don't want to scare anybody, but in big bold down at the bottom, I think maybe next year, solar might be slightly more expensive to go on a home. You know, nothing crazy. I'd say nothing over like 5%, but, um, you know, we're having to... Be nice. um, nice to doggy. Go to work. Go to work. <laughs> um, so um, it, we might see a slight increase, nothing too crazy. And I think the solar, the solar curve is going to generally keep keep going down, solar is going to decrease in cost over time, but we'll see what 2022 um, has in store for us. But I do know that um, we've seen an incredible amount of adoption in home solar. I think um, it's given a lot of, it's given a lot of consumer confidence in the technology. I think that the um, that utility companies have uh, confidence in it as well in terms of its safety um, and its ability to implement into uh, the existing grid. And so, you know, we're really looking forward to more adoption. Um, but, you know, we're just, we're just chipping away little chunks at a time at every home. Um, and, you know, we really look forward to and um, would like to see some of these larger solar developments happen too, because that, that can contribute towards that renewable energy goal in a much quicker fashion than, than you know, than we're going. However, every little bit helps in um, helping people at the home level you know, for us has been a big part of the reason of why, why we do what we do. So um, thanks, thanks for giving me the chance to speak. You know, I, I guess probably towards the end, it sounds like there might be some questions. I'm happy to um, stick around and answer questions for anybody. And if there's anything specific to the presentation right now, anybody wants to ask um, real quick, you know, feel free. All right, we'll uh, have, have Q and A's in a second. Uh, but first, Satchel, could we see slide 14? Um, yes, Mark. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we always want to end uh, by highlighting action opportunities. Um, if uh, uh, you, you've got a, excited about solar, um, here are some some things you can do to act on that. Um, at their January meeting, uh, Home Electric. Uh, Association is going to have an update on their renewable energy policy. Um, that's the uh, the 50% by 2025 goal uh, that we mentioned earlier. Um, also, at some point uh, in the coming year, uh, the borough assembly is going to be making a decision on the uh, the tax exemption for IPPs that we've been talking about. So, um, the, this will be a good opportunity to to learn more about that. And. Uh, um, and then uh, in Jan I, I also in January, on January 6th, uh, Jen Miller uh, is going to be talking at the uh, Kenan Peninsula Economic uh, Outlook Forum. So you can uh, learn some more about uh, 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 some how, how solar and, and IPPs in general can uh, have potential for our economy. And of course, uh, the most impactful thing you can do is in the spring, HEA is going to have a board of directors election and uh, if you're an HEA member, you can vote for a pro renewable director. And uh, even if you're not, you can you can volunteer um, and campaign for pro renewable directors. Um, so let's not forget that uh, HEA is a co-op, and uh, and and we uh, we have uh, some power over it. So next slide, please, Satchel. 
Um, so, so here's here's an overview of uh, our upcoming Repower the Peninsula events. We're uh, going to continue looking at the different technologies, renewable technologies that we have for uh, meeting this 50% uh, by 2025 goal. And uh, as always, uh, you can get in touch with me. My email's uh, over there off to the side, bennettinthekeeper.org. So I'll uh, uh, stay stay on the Zoom um, for as long as people have questions and want to ask about energy. Um, uh, Hig Hig is also here. Um, I'm not sure I'm not sure if he wants to stay on all night, but um, uh, if you if you have questions, uh, now's uh, now's a chance to get answers. I just wanted to note that in the in the chat, Jim mentioned that the uh, the January meeting has changed to January 11th. Okay, good. All right. So, um, if I could convey a somewhat different talking point to Hig, that the nature of renewables, be they wind or hydro or solar, is to pay a lot of money up front, and then the wind and the photons and the water are free. So when you look at the issue of property taxes, if I want a watt of gas-fired power generator, even fabulous one with titanium in the last 30 years, it's a dollar a watt. Um, Solar is only a little bit more, but with a slow capacity factor, it ends up being 10 times more upfront investment to generate that energy for 25 years into the future. So the nature of any renewable product, wind or solar or hydro, is a huge upfront costs and then very low uh, energy costs into the future. And you don't have to care about carbon emissions of the planet to like very low energy costs into the future. So when you only have a property tax scheme and not any income tax scheme, that's inherently biased against a renewable project with huge upfront costs and minimal operating expense. Yeah, I think I think I think that that is a is a sensible way to to frame it. Um, the, it, it. I mean, if you can imagine just sitting down and thinking about building a, a, a solar farm, you put a whole bunch of money um, into improving this property that will then have uh, solar panels on it. And then that immediately gets taxed, like it basically increases the value of the property by that amount. And so um, it, that that becomes a very big part. And that's why when I forget what number she said exactly, but something like 15% or something tax on that on that business because of that, that effect that, that David's describing there. Yeah, I, look, I look on my uh, solar system as I just bought 20 years worth of electricity all at one time. Hey, can you remind us um, when the assembly will be discussing this again, if you know, and maybe provide a little insight on um, if there are specific assembly members we should be talking to about this issue and sort of where the sticking points might be for getting this passed. Yeah, I'd say only, I'm, you know, I only know so much about that, but I'll, I'll answer it as best I can. So uh, there, I believe it is a, the finance committee is going to be discussing this uh, specifically in January. And so that's, that's a fairly concrete step um, along that path. Um, it was, it was originally going to be the December meeting. It got delayed till, till January. Um, and I think that uh, whoever your assembly member is, like talking to them, um, and uh, uh, you know about about this this possibility is is worth worth doing. Um, I do not know. I don't know the po political landscape to the level that we're like, oh, everyone needs to talk to so and so because you know they're leaning against. But you know maybe with, with you could convince them to to lean the other way. But. I do think that um, it's helpful, even even for assembly members, it might be supportive as it is to 
hear, you know, that, that people are actually paying attention to this process and, um, and uh, you know, interested in, in renewable development on, on, uh, on the Kenai Peninsula and the way this might, might impact that. So I, I do think that's a valuable thing to do. And I say you that have speaking a, of myself, not as an RSAC member. <laughs> do, do you have a feel for how likely it is to, to get through the finance committee and then through the uh, assembly and then the mayor didn't seem very interested in it. So, you know, how to, yeah. how to get all of that. Um, you know, I, I think there's reasons for, for some optimism. I mean, there, I think a lot of the assembly is uh, supportive. I mean, it's, this is really something that can bring in more, you know, private industry, you know, private development. Uh, uh, and I think that's something that, that uh, even some assembly members that may not, not be so concerned about um, what our electricity mix is, uh, might be interested in that. Um, whether it is a question of it having to be veto proof or not, I, I don't know. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, whether the mayor is, uh, he's definitely not enthusiastic. Um, is he, is this a, is this a question of, uh, is, is he going to just um, veto it no matter what, what comes through, or is it something where he's really open to, to being convinced? I, I, I don't know enough of that political landscape to really speculate. But it does seem possible there'd be a veto-proof majority, so that that would be reassuring, I guess. Um, because Dave Thomas is in the room and Mark brought this up, uh, I'm I'm curious a little bit about the annual reconciliation and sort of like how one would go about having like bringing that potential policy change to the RCA? So any member of the public can comment on RCA dockets that have been opened. Um, HEA went and asked for 10% net metering, uh, kind of negotiated down to 7% with, I believe RAPA was the primary intervener because they're trying to look out for lower income consumers. Um, so I'm not aware of a current pending case. Um, and uh, one could always write an email to the five sitting commissioners and say, hey, I think you ought to allow annual, um, annual averaging. Um, it does represent a greater subsidy from non-net metering members towards net metering members. There is uh, an economic issue uh, justice issue there because you know <laughs> rich people like <laughs> this engineer and another engineer is online and you know the the doctorate in 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 the yurt in solovia have net metering systems and you know someone with a mic job typically does not um and so when you move funds from poor customer members to richer members, then RAPA will say, hey, we argue against that. Um, and, and to allow even larger net metered systems to pencil out, um, which annual, um, uh, annual averaging would, then raises that economic justice issue more. And now you're balancing economic justice against reducing carbon and of course people all along the political spectrum will fall on different have different opinions about that um so yeah i mean right i suppose write your commissioners <laughs> your regular commissioners of alaska um in in favor of annual averaging um when there's a case before them make public comments. It's uh, Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. Um, uh, once a month when, when they take public comments. But I'm not aware of a current net metering case speci docket specifically before them. Um, and, and also, you know, advocate to your local cooperative board because those nine directors, whether you're an HEA or Chugatraman, Newsker, Golden Valley, um, ultimately determine what 
rates their staff tries to take before the RCA. Um, and they won't say yes unless somebody asks. Um, but as we found last year, they, they sometimes say no. Does that, <laughs> that was all over the place, but does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. And thanks for bringing in that perspective. And I think it's an important perspective. And I I guess I have a follow-up question. I know HEA has a um, line of credit program that's up to $10,000 so at a maybe 5% interest rate or 4.5% interest rate. 4.8 or I forget exactly where it is. It floats with our cost of money, but but yeah, so a, a very market competitive rate for us, basically a small home improvement loan. Right, and, and I, I wonder, has HEA ever considered um, either upping the cap um, a little more than 10,000 so that you know, I, I imagine I haven't, I'm a renter, I haven't personally budgeted out solar on my house, but um, I imagine most systems are more than 10 grand. And um, yeah, I wonder if, if HEA were to raise that cap, solar could really be funded through that program. Or have you discussed as a board um, adopting something like an on-bill financing program, which through, you know, the federal assistance could actually create a much lower interest rate um, on those on-bill credit programs. So I'm, I'm no longer on, on the board, although I was yes. for 13 years and Aaron and, and Jim who are in attendance are still on the board, but um, HA did increase the line of credit from 5,000 to 10,000. And I think the biggest primary motivator for that was not that people are gonna go out and buy $10,000 hot tubs, but that they were gonna potentially, it would enable lower income members who might not have that much in their bank account to put in a typical size solar system, like a three kilowatt, 10 panel residential solar system, or convert a fuel oil or propane heating system to a heat pump, that $10,000 would be in the ballpark of either of those beneficial, uh, in one case, beneficial electrification projects, in one case, you know, renewable energy generation projects. And they could also apply it towards an electric vehicle, but it, it's, you know, a small fraction of a Tesla. Um, but they could use it for any, any of those things. And, and, and the board did double that, um, that limit to their line of credit system. And the line of credit program is one of the very few things unregulated by the RCA. So the nine members of the board can click their heels and do whatever they want with the line of credit program. Um, and, and most recently doubled it to facilitate, um, uh, I believe mostly net metering. Certainly my vote was in favor of net metering and heat pumps that both of those would be covered under that. And then it is on bill financing, it just, you know, you're going to owe, you know, owe something over five or 10 years, monthly payments, and it's just going to show up on your bill. And if you've chosen wisely, then, you know, your energy savings should more than offset that, that line item on your, on your bill. Thank you. It, it strikes me like, you know, listening to that thought process that, um, that the borough might benefit from someone uh, who essentially could, not, not, it's not quite as an advocate for, for low income uh, rate payers, but as a sort of a, I don't know, to basically assist them in taking advantage of the programs that already exist. Um, you know, they, that the, the combination of, of uh, some various beneficial electrification and, and renewable generation options, you know, solar options, plus uh, that, that uh, you know, quite good loan uh, program you know, might mean that you really, you really could. Uh, a lot of low-income people could really benefit off of that. <clears throat> but you know, one of the one of the things, one of the challenges is like, yeah, figure all that out uh, while also holding down your two two jobs and uh, being a single parent or whatever it is that that are your your struggles, and um, that can be pretty difficult. So, um, I, I wonder, is there anyone out there doing that um, that anyone knows of? I guess.
Well, I'm not aware of anybody on that, but I, I did want to follow up on a couple of items. One uh, on the um, um, the discussion about um, the annual annual versus monthly uh, um, balancing of your account. Uh, when we were first putting together the the uh, net metering program like 12 years ago, um, that was a main discussion item. Um, the environmental community was was really pushing hard for the annual for an annual uh, reconciliation, um, and it it uh, it was in there for a while, and then that was one of the items that got uh, taken out when when it finally was agreed to as sort of a um, compromise position, I guess, uh, was to put it in a monthly monthly reconciliation instead. Um, so you could perhaps go back to the notes or, or some of the folks that were working on it back then and, and discuss how they how they came about that. But um, but that was it was a big point of contention uh, at that time. Um, it didn't it didn't go through. Um, and at this point, it's basically it's law. I suppose you could get your legislator also to try to put a bill out in in Juno to require that it be changed. So that'd be another another method. Um, and I was I was curious, maybe Mark or, or Satchel, if you know, um, if we're actually that close on our cap again. Um, seems like we're getting there all the time. Um, do we have? I mean, if you, it seems like we've been putting through fifty to one hundred new members every year. Um, is that is that online again this year for this summer? And at which point we might end up hitting that seven percent sooner rather than later. I don't know what the anticipated timeline is um, or how close we were. That's kind of why I proposed the question earlier, but um, ASAP, um, so Alaska Center for Energy and Power, he generally does an annual analysis. So he'll, he'll keep track of the total deployment per utility and then um, kind of, of a projected timeline based on the, the previous two years. It, it, Tends to be kind of, I think, a difficult thing for him to estimate, though, too, because of how steep it is on the other end. Um, so I'm not sure where where we will be at soon. I would in, in, in response to a question by Hig, I checked my emails, and as of eight days ago, uh, HEA was at 84% of their cap, 84% of their 7% cap. So. 2,990 kilowatts out of our 3547 kilowatt cap, 87% of the way there. <clears throat> and don't tell anyone I told you, but if we're, point, if we're at 6.99% and you show up two weeks later, we're not gonna say no to a member who wants to do net metering when we said yes to the last 500 members. Like, uh, on a on a broader policy issue, maybe the installers want to advocate for this, and as a voter, maybe you want to advocate for this. If you're thinking about a system and you want to put it in next summer, we're not going to say no to you. We're like we're more concerned about our members than the RCA. <laughs> Well, whenever whenever a uh, conversation comes up about the net metering cap, I always wonder if uh, if anyone's ever ever determined a threshold of net metering penetration where uh, uh, where this uh, a cost shifting effect uh, becomes quantifiable and and invariability starts to be an issue. Like, is there like because there's always the conversation of raising the cap and and kind of incrementing it, but is there is there like a hypothetical maximum that, that we could have without uh, significant ill effects? Uh, I'll go ahead and dive into the weeds now. So, um, so we're right at three megawatts net metering. That really doesn't affect our integration costs. You know, these are over hundreds of roofs, and the cloud doesn't blow over hundreds of roofs at exactly the same time. Now, when you look at 20 megawatts of solar at, let's say, RIPP's proposed location, 
well, one cloud can blow over that facility, you know, in a few minutes. And suddenly it was chugging along at 18 megawatts and it goes to two. So that's an integration cost to the utility to stand ready to make up that, you know, like 15 megawatts just went away. Um, and the fact that if we do it with a battery, we put six kilowatt hours in and take five kilowatt hours out, batteries are not 100% efficient. So that's a cost. Um, so net metering is in many ways down in the weeds. It's down in the weeds in terms of integration because it's non-coincident. What happens on my roof doesn't happen on you know, Aaron's roof at the same time. But also the scale is smaller with three megawatts currently installed net metering that that is small compared to a proposed 20 megawatt uh, utility scale solar. Um, so so integration is, is less of an issue. My understanding of RAPA's concerns has been it, it is a subsidy to net metering members. They're, they get to use the system as a battery and we don't get charged for getting to use the system as a battery. They get to sell retail at retail power rates um, for most of what they produce, um, where from any other vendor, we would pay them a third for non for power. So where does that subsidy come from? And well, ultimately it comes from all the members. You know, it comes from a rich member like myself, and it comes from poor members. And then Rappa raises the hand and says, "Hey, you know, there's an economic issue here when when some members get a subsidy that others can't afford to buy into." Is is that subsidy quantifiable at all? Can you can you say that with this much penetration net metering that there's so much? Well, cost most shipping? if you put in a three kilowatt system and you reconcile it monthly almost every kilowatt hour you generate is going to save you retail. It's going to come off your retail rate. So you're getting 24 cents. If we're, we're, we are negotiated <laughs> with RIPP and their energy to us is not worth 24 cents. We can't dispatch it. We can't have it when we want it. Um, their energy is worth, you know, and I'm, you know, we'll just say plus or minus a penny, it's worth seven cents. So we're giving members 24 cents when they offset their retail consumption. Where for a product, uh, non firm energy that's worth seven or eight cents to us. Um, so, so that's a subsidy. Now, it, it certainly can be argued that to meet our renewable goal, well, these net meter members have paid all the capital, right? They bought the system. This system cost them $10,000 or $25,000. And that's capital costs the, the cooperative did not incur. Individual members incurred it to have the, the panels on their, installed on their roof. Um, so, like which numbers do you want to focus on the capital cost saved or the great deal they get on the energy is seems to fall along political lines and what you think about renewables and carbon and, and lots of things. Um, but if you can't afford a solar system and lots of other people put solar systems on their houses, then, well, yeah, your, your bill is going to go up a little bit. And then again, RAPA says, raises an objection and we don't get everything we asked for from the RCA. I think one piece of that sort of question that's out of the scope of really what HEA can even reasonably consider, but is externalities in all of this. And, and so, um, and it, it's, a, it's not something you can easily Pin down, but basically, when you, you know, there's an agreement that happens between a utility and a and a um, a consumer of electricity, and they they agree to pay some money for something. And in an ideal laissez-faire economic system, they're both happy, and so they made the world wealthier by basically the consumer got the electricity and the the producer got the money, and they both feel better off than they were before. But even in that process. 
say there's a natural gas plant that was burning and releasing CO2, and that that then you know incrementally led to sea level rise and and uh, you know dropped the prices of property in coastal Houston. That person in coastal Houston was not party to that agreement. They never they never had a chance to say, well, wait a second, you should give me a penny or two in there too, because uh, you know that's one of the consequences of this. And they, they just never had a chance to be part of that. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think that's one of the things that really complicates this sort of ethical, the ethical framework that uh, you, might, you might try to, try to I don't know, use when, 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 when deciding you know, what should net meter policy be. Um, you know, perhaps that additional 17 cents that the, that the uh, consumer got paid is actually worthwhile uh, because it, it, uh, it is offset by decreased costs, you know, for people in coastal Houston, Bangladesh, Singapore, Netherlands. Um, anyway, so I, it, you know, it gets, it gets a little complicated when you go out that far. But outside of what HEA can reasonably, I think, even consider in their in their calculation. I don't think you have to invoke Bangladesh because in a big storm, I could lose more property than I once owned in Seattle. Well, and 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 and, and for anyone who's reading Neil Stephenson's uh, termination shock, uh, they will recognize somewhat the, some of the list of different different places I mentioned in there. And there's there's a it's a very interesting exploration of this question. Actually, I, I, I we're, I'm only halfway through it, so I can't can't recommend it to the end, but. It's an interesting book. And I was gonna, I was gonna mention on uh, to Ben's Ben's question a little bit uh, from a kind of technical standpoint. Um, there is some um, issues that uh, that HEA has to uh, resolve. If, for instance, if too many, too many net metering. I don't know what the number too many is, but too many net metering customers are all on one area. Um, so say there's a you know they have a transformer there. And uh, all of a sudden, they need to have a bigger transformer there because they've got so many people putting uh, power into the into the line at that location. Um, so there is some technical issues that I know Tyler has mentioned. He, I mean, he he's really in, heavily involved in the net metering program, um, but he also um, um, has mentioned you know that type of thing. I mean, he's going like the the um, standard um, system. It's no problem. I mean, the cap is is silly. It's um, three percent, one and a half percent, or whatever it is, three percent, seven percent. It's really a tenth of that because our our uh, capacity factor is really only ten percent. Um, so they, um, so we're really not anywhere near our any type of a system failure because of too many net metering on houses. Uh, but what is but what is more of a concern to uh, to Tyler and probably from a technical standpoint is just how many are in one location um, so that we don't overload, don't overload any one part of the system. And to reiterate Jim's point and in a fuller answer to a previous question by Ben, um, right, it, Alaska solar systems have a capacity factor of 10 or 11%. So when we say we're approaching 7% of our average load, energy-wise, we're only approaching 0.7%. The energy on our system is still one well under 1% net meter. So again, it's, it is down in the weeds to what everyone pays per kilowatt hour. It's, it's not big. And to reinforce what Jim just said, if you've got a subdivision with a lot of well-off residents who say a third of them might put in net metering systems on a on a sunny day sunny afternoon my wife's solar system is carrying the 12 closest houses around well get 10 or 20 such houses net metering houses in the same area and we might have to upsize the conductors and upsize the transformers that serve that area. And now there's a system cost to that. And it's a different system cost, right? We traditionally are, when we upgrade the system, it was to sell more 
energy and and which had margins in it now we're upgrade we're paying to upgrade the system to sell less energy and maybe that's the direction we want to go but it's a different paradigm another thing that i'd like to point out is just that subsidizing isn't just for solar in a way different members subsidizing other members is somewhat irrevocably baked into the system based on how the rates are set up in the first place. Because most of, you know, as was mentioned way back at the beginning, most of our costs are fixed costs. By charging per kilowatt hour, you're kind of pretending that most of the costs are incurred per kilowatt hour, but most of them aren't. So we always, have had people who use more energy subsidizing people who use less energy. It's pretty much across all utilities. And similarly, things that are harder to figure out but are absolutely true is that people who live in you know, more centralized places that are easier to get to and repair the power lines are subsidizing people like me in Soldovia or the folks in Nan Wallach, and we don't have the full cost on how much ATA spent in the last week on helicopters trying to fix the power over here, but that was definitely a subsidy too. So I think it's kind of important to remember that there are subsidies, but that it's also somewhat unavoidable, like trying to make a system that's actually practical and actually fair is something we should definitely strive to, but we're never going to completely meet both of those. If something was like, if you actually knew the exact cost to serve each member, you could make it perfectly fair and everybody would have their very own electric rate. And, you know, on the other side, you can make it simpler and simpler, and then you might have that cross subsidization be a bigger and bigger problem. So it's not really it's not an easy question, even if you took net metering completely out of it. And, you know, and that's some of the debate over things like the system delivery charge kind of falls right in there. Is how do you deal with fixed costs? How do you deal with fairness? How do you deal with people understanding their bills? It's, it's not an easy question. It was one of my rude awakenings on the board a dozen years ago. So we looked at the line extension policy and as an engineer, I thought, well, this is stupid easy. You're like X feet from the current system and your transformer needs to be Y sized. So there's a formula for what it costs to connect you. But I'm like, oh, no, no, we have to treat all the residential members the same. So we have a uniform price, largely, um, for line extension policy, even though the apartment dweller in city center is so much easier to serve than the person at the very end of the dirt road. Um, and we are required by RCA regulation by some of our lenders, particularly our US, that we electrify to some extent anyone who wants to be. And Ultimately, that that's why there's well, that's why there are rural cooperatives, right? Because the people who are looking to make money, Con Ed, PG&E, and the investor-owned utilities, they didn't serve the flyover states. They didn't serve Alaska. No one came here to energize the peninsula or even Anchorage. It was cooperatives that said, "Well, no one else is going to do it. We'll do it." So our our legacy is to energize anyone who wants to even when it doesn't make commercial sense. And, and that's a weird business model, but it's, it's fundamental to a cooperative. Well, if nobody has any other questions, I think that's a, that's a very good note to end on. So uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming out and uh, I, I hope you hope you learned something about solar. So, thank you. I'd like to. I'd like. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah, I'd like I'd like to thank you, Ben, for for coming to our meetings religiously, practically every month. Um, that's pretty awesome. Louis was just mentioning yesterday he wishes that there were more people coming to our meetings, but he appreciated that you that you do come to them. All right. Did Did everybody hear that? The next next meeting's the eleventh. Is that right? Yes. All right. And and there's there's going to be a. Uh, a renewable policy update, so fun stuff. All right, well, thank you all again.